everyone and welcome to another episode of Books and Shit with myself, Charlie Author. Um, as I have been going on and on about on my page on previous episodes, um, I have a really amazing episode today because I am speaking with Mr. J. Christoph. Now, as you guys know, and this is a bit cringy because obviously he's here, but as you guys know, Jay is my favourite author ever. And I actually, <laughs> I actually put down, um, you know, if you could have anybody on Books and Shit, who would it be? So this is a huge deal for me, guys. Okay. So without further ado, <laughs> hello. <laughs> How are uh, you? <laughs> doing? No pressure or anything like that. <laughs> no, I, I am. I am nowhere near as amusing or intelligent as you think I am, but I'll try not to let you down too much. Oh, thank you, thank you. I mean, one of the big things anyway is even just doing this because like, you know, when I was speaking to my friends and, and you know, they were like, oh, how did you get this? And then, you know, I asked him like that, you yeah. know, the whole, the fact that you have this connection with your readers at all is an amazing thing. Do you know what I mean? Like people with your kind of, um, success and you know all this kind of thing you can't really get to them there's I I think I even messaged you like do I have to ask somebody for this or can you know can I just speak to you kind of thing yeah I mean we, we've been chatting for ages though so it kind of helps yeah. when you know there's there's a kind of personal relationship I guess um I I totally get why some authors make it making it difficult is the wrong way to describe it but kind of take a step back from this kind of stuff because it does take up a lot of time uh, and the more you put of yourself out there the more kind of exposed you are so I, I totally get why some authors aren't comfortable doing that I mean we're all introverts as a general rule authors like we spend all our time with the people that live inside our head I'm not <laughs> very good with real life people so I, I totally get why some authors are like that but at the same time you folks let me do this for a living you know i i have the best job that i've ever had so i want to make you i want to make you feel like i appreciate you i don't take you for granted so i, no, no, I try and walk that line no i definitely definitely appreciate that like even when as i said speaking with friends about it and another friend was like oh my gosh i spoke to him as well and he said this and it's just like we were having this absolute fangirl moment over brunch and it was really sad and <laughs> it's cool it's cool you know, it was it was amazing. So thank you for having that kind of, you know, I'd said relationship with us because it's 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 amazing. I, I try. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like like I said, I, I get why some authors don't do it. It, it can be uncomfortable and it, and it takes a lot of time. It's the truth of that, the matter. That was my next question. It's just like, I know, you know, I've messaged you and blah, blah, blah. blah. What does your inbox look like? Because <laughs> I cannot imagine, just, you know, of names. Like, how do you keep up with what I can only assume are thousands of people just talking <laughs> just talking and, um, and commenting. i mean my, my inbox like work wise i i keep on top of that I, I kind of devote a certain amount of time every day to do admin um, to deal with editors and publishers and that kind of stuff it's a slippery slope like if you let it get away from you it can totally get away from you i learned that early on so mm. it's kind of like going to the gym it's something you don't like doing but you have to do it if you don't do it you suffer the consequences so I got pretty good at that. Um, and as far as like handling DMs and stuff on Instagram, I, I do it when I go down and get my coffee in the morning uh, and I dedicate some time to it each night. Um, it's just a matter of making time, finding time for it, which is why I get some authors don't do it because you only have so much hours in the day and when it comes down to it, mm. I'm sure most readers would rather a new book from their favorite author rather than an answer on DM, you know what I mean? So. Um, <laughs> uh so yeah it, it, it's it's a juggling act but yeah I, I learned early on the consequences of not staying on top of it regularly so I got into the habit just like going to the gym and once you start doing it as a ritual it, it becomes a little easier it's second nature cool um so just for my own understanding because obviously I don't have a gazillion followers but when we you know like and comment and stuff does it genuinely just pop up at the bottom say in like twelve thousand? You know, like, because, you know, I'll get a little pop up saying one comment. <laughs> Does yours literally say like hundreds, the little bubble? Will it say hundreds on it? Or yeah, I mean, you turn it, you turn off the notifications on your phone and stuff. Otherwise, your phone would be buzzing all day. So you turn off all notifications. But yeah, I, you log into the post that you made and you can see. Yeah. Um, 
massive see the likes and, and measure your self-esteem and, and track your self-worth and what people gravitate towards and what people don't uh yeah <laughs> So you, you see all of it. The, the the metrics and the analytics can be pretty brutally honest if you want them to be. <laughs> that that's funny. That's funny. Okay, cool. I've had my little fangirl moment now. So, um, as I mentioned to you before, uh, books and shit listeners are uh, primarily indie authors, indie writers. Um, so before we go on to the awesome, awesome books, um, which I have strategically placed behind me, guys, because- Yeah, I noticed that, very good. You know, yeah. good <laughs> um, you know once um, Empire arrives, it's all gonna change. It's all gonna change. Yeah, you um, might need a show. <laughs> it's, no, it's I, a big book, it's a thick book. Like After seeing the production video, I'm like, where am I gonna put it? <laughs> yeah. Particularly if you ordered a couple of copies, it's it's going to take up space really quickly. Yeah, that's that's the running joke because I think I have all of them bar like a Australian paperback version or something, but I didn't need that. Oh wow, okay. But I think that's I going to be one of those entire shelves yeah. behind you. That's, yeah, that's I'm really excited for September, but my bank account isn't because it's. Just <laughs> I hope I really hope you like the book. It's gonna be embarrassing for both of us if you're like, eh, it's okay. I ordered like two thousand copies of it. It's it's fine. Uh, what it's I do this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess you have a lot of you lot of, have a lot of fuel to burn come winter. I I'm told winter in England gets very cold, so you know. So so cold. Um but so I digress. And this is why I have to write down my questions because I just go off on one, right? Um yes, so, right. as I was saying. Uh, books and shit um, listeners are usually indie writers so we're going to do the kind of writery thing and first question or you know we'll start from there what is your I guess typical uh, writing process like you know uh, an idea pops in it all just comes out and then we don't write for 10 years how do you how do you go about your process it depends a little bit on the book um, every book is different and obviously I co-author with Amy as well. So the process there is naturally different. It usually, I mean, it always starts with a single idea. I have like a, a scrapbook. It's really a Word document, but it's essentially a scrapbook where I just scribble down any thought that comes into my head. Oh, cool. um, and sometimes those thoughts grow into concepts for books and sometimes they don't do anything at all. Um, so the key world building idea that I had for Empire was an idea that I had back in 2008. Like the, the first book, the first novel that I ever finished was a vampire novel. Um, it was terrible as most first novels tend to be. It's like this urban fantasy thing. Yeah. And I wrote it right at the height, well, right at the tail end of Twilight Hysteria, yeah. which is a really bad time to write a vampire book because everyone's just over them. But the the key idea being that vampires can't choose who they turn like you get bitten and you die and sometimes you wake up 30 seconds later and you're a vampire young and perfect forever and sometimes you decompose for six or seven days and then you wake up and so you're this in this kind of half-life with a brain that's decomposed to mush and you're possessed of the animal instincts of a vampire but you don't really have human intelligence so yeah. that was an idea that's been beating around inside my head since that first book uh, and I liked it, so I kind of resurrected it, yep. pardon the pun, uh, for Empire. But the the idea for the chief relationship in Empire really came to me when I was working on Dark Dawn. Um, one of my favorite relationships in that series is the relationship between Mia and Mercurio, who is her mentor. He's this kind of old, grizzled, yeah. bitter, jaded, grumpy mentor trope guy. Um, and Mia is, oh, cool. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and Mia is the kind of plucky young protege and I, and I really like that dynamic I like the trope of found family people who come to mean as much as you know brother and sister or parent and child even though they're not biologically related there's no bonds of blood there's just bonds of love I really like that idea yeah, that but Mia and Mercurio had kind of established that relationship before the book started yeah. so I wanted to explore the formation of a relationship like that two people who don't necessarily like each other and have a lot of reasons to dislike each other mm. kind of through trial by fire getting forced together and coming to care for each other in that way um, so they were the the, the the two kind of genesis ideas for empire but sometimes it can be a conversation that i have or, or a television show that i see or i mean the, the genesis for never Night was a conversation that i watched between two drunken 
lady friends on New Year's Eve, like not lady friends, like friends who are ladies. Um, <laughs> and they were arguing about the word cunt and whether or not it was offensive. Yes. Uh, and both of them were, were quite passionate and, and uh, vocal in their opinions. One was for and one was against. I kind of watched that argument take place and it planted a seed in my head. I went away a few weeks later and wrote the scene that became the conversation between Mia and Trick, I think at the end of chapter five. And that was, that was how Nevin and I started. I kind of wrote that scene. And at the end of it, I wanted to know who this girl was. So I, I wrote a book to kind of find out who she was. So no, it can I come from anywhere. No, I love that idea that it's really organic because I feel like we've had, well, I think we, um, you know, I have kind of a writer community on online and we're always in kind of overthinking, I want to say, like not necessarily for, for everybody, but there's just this idea that you have to be hitting these points and you have to have your next thing lined up and you have to know what's coming next and, you know, all of those kind of things. And I've personally never written like that. I'm just like, okay, if you want, what's coming next kind of thing. And then it builds and it grows and it turns into something or doesn't sometimes. Um, but I do like the idea that the, you know, your ideas are just, you know, it could, as I said, a random conversation between two lady friends and then. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's I mean, there, there's definitely something to be said for being strategic in the sense that, you know, if you've got five cool ideas in your scrapbook that you're interested in writing, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with examining say the marketability I guess is a good way to look at it of those ideas and trying to discern which one has the potential to be more successful I mean it depends what your motivations are as an author like if you just want to write stories that you want to write and you don't care whether anyone reads them you don't care about paying your mortgage or your electricity bills that's cool that's a totally cool way to make art um, if you want to do it for a living and actually like keep your lights on and the telly going with the money that you make from being an author then there's nothing wrong with approaching it a little more strategically and examining, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to write to trends. I wouldn't recommend trying to discern trends because publishing moves so goddamn slowly, unless you're, unless you're publishing on e platforms, okay. traditional publishing moves so slowly that if you're trying to catch a trend, the trend will be dead by the time your book hits the shelves. Like even if you smash the book out in a few months, by the time it's vetted, sold, edited, produced and shipped, and it's probably 18 months have passed. So the trend is probably gone. Um, a friend of mine was telling me about a conversation. She was on a romance writers panel and romance writers kind of by definition, they have to be super prolific and write very quickly. Like they, they put out a lot of product in the course of a year. Mm -hmm. And she was, on a, she was on a panel with a very famous romance author who got asked a question about writing to trend and straight faced, this author said, if you could write the book in three or four weeks mm -hmm. and then get it up on an e-platform quickly, then yes, try and write to a trend, otherwise don't bother. Um, but that, that, yeah, that, that's how difficult it is writing to trends. But there's nothing wrong with being aware of marketability and commercial concepts um, and understanding what people kind of gravitate towards and what they don't. That there's nothing wrong with being analytical in that sense, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, for myself, I'm writing a, a book at the, or querying a book at the moment, um, which... Oh, good luck. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, which features shape-shifting wolves. So not werewolves, you know, they don't turn by the moon, um, but they're shape-shifters. And, you know, doing my own research and, you know, seeing shifter novels, it's all very much the, you know, topless guy on the front and I'm going to, sure. you know, run you... It, you know, there's this idea of what a wolf inspired story is like, and that isn't necessarily at the moment anyway, too popular. I mean, it is, but not necessarily commercially. And I, I said, I struggled for a bit in the sense of, I want to write this story and I like this story, um, but am I setting myself up essentially for quote unquote failure because it's not what an agent is particularly looking for now and like I get that this industry is so just fluid that it's not necessarily that it's bad she tells herself um <laughs> not necessarily that it's bad but it's just not right for now and that is such a hard thing to get your head around because you could just wait a year and query the same story and then it's like yep we want it and it's just like how do you navigate that how do you work through that it's just it's too much <laughs> It's, it's really hard, um, but it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, you know, that book that I wrote in 2008, 
that awful first novel. Um, you know, first of all, the act of writing, it's, if, if nothing else, right? It's sitting down and writing your book every day is teaching you how to write a book. Um, even if that book never goes anywhere, it's teaching you your chops. And the more you do it, it's like anything, the better you're going to get at it. But it could be that the book you're working on now, it, it might not do anything, but it might spark the thought that fucking 13 years later turns into, you know, the biggest, most hyped book you've ever written in your life. Um, you know, that book I wrote in 2008 was, it was bad. Uh, I'll <laughs> admit it, but the idea in that planted the seed that grew into the book that is Empire. So it's, it's never wasted time. Um, and, I, and I understand the impetus that, you know, you want to get out there and you want to get published now. You, you, want, you see what other people have and you want it. And that's cool. It's great to be ambitious and it's great to be driven, but don't, don't ever think it's wasted time. Like even, even if a book doesn't do what you want it to do, um, you're still honing your craft. You're still learning how to write. You're still learning the discipline of writing. Um, and that's the most important thing you can, you can ever lay down. That's the groundwork that's, that's going to be the foundation of the rest of your career. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said for writing from the heart. Um, and who knows, like the, the, the thing that you're writing that's off end at the moment, it might suddenly blow up. Like you might bring a cool enough twist to an old idea that starts an entirely new trend all of its own. I mean, look at what Buffy in Twilight did for vampires. Like it was a slightly different spin on a pretty traditional trope. And all of a sudden it was like an entirely new lease of life, so. I get that. See, you've heard it here, guys. You know, it's never yeah. the time. New York Times never. selling author has said so. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's never wasted time, ever. Like, if, even if even if nothing comes of it, at least you are creating art. Like, it sounds kind of hippie and dippy to say this, but at least you're not wasting that time in front of the fucking TV or in front of Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Like, it's a, it's a positive outlet for your energy. You're creating something. You're putting something back into the world. There's not a lot of people who do that. And there's not a lot of people who are brave enough to do that. So if that's the way you're choosing to spend your free time, then fucking good on you. Like, you it's it a cooler better. way than most people do. <laughs> no, 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 that's cool. Thank you. Um, one of the questions we had, you know, I asked um, people to send in their questions. And one of them was asking about the, obviously, the writing process, but co-authoring. So you touched, obviously, on working with um, Amy Kaufman. Um, how does that differ to working on your own? It seems kind of obvious, obviously, there's another person there. But how does that, how do you work? Do you write a chapter? I write a chapter? What? <laughs> how yeah. does, what do we do? We, we tend to divide the labor based on character. So, you know, there will, so for example, in Illuminae, there were probably three main characters. There was Katie, there was Ezra, and there was Aiden. And we, we kind of fell into traditional gender roles to begin with. So Amy wrote the girl and I wrote the guys and Aiden was kind of asexual, I guess, but I wrote Aiden as well. Um, so we divide up the labor based on character lines. We will get together and brainstorm ideas. Um, when I, when I write by myself, I'm traditionally a pantser. I kind of make it up as I go and I, I find the story as I write it. But when you're co-authoring, obviously you can't do that because you know, if you kill a character that your co-author was planning to do some big, amazing reveal with, that's, that's going to make things, everything fall apart. So we tend to get together and plot about 100 pages in advance. Um, we've found if we do much more than that, we'll think of cooler ideas as we write. Like we will... Even though we're plotting, we do kind of discover the story as we write. And if you plot an entire novel and then 100 pages in, come up with a really cool idea that, you know, you've wasted all that extra time that you spent plotting the novel that you then have to throw in the bin. So we plot about 100 pages. We'll divide those 100 pages up into POVs, into which character we think will be best to deliver that information. Uh, and then we go away and, and write our individual pieces and kind of float the document back and forth between us. Um, and, you know, we kind of talk on Gchat. If we, if we come up with a cool idea that changes things, then we'll bounce those ideas back and forth. We have a living Google Doc that kind of outlines the plot, and that's a constantly evolving document, but we have one master word document. We're almost like, it's like one of those, you know, submarine movies where, you know, the commander has to leave the deck and says, you know, you have the con to lieutenant number one or whatever, like we hand over the document and we say, you have the master. And so, I can't change it. When Amy has the master, I can't do anything. I can't touch it. 
So I have to kind of put down notes if there are things that I want to change. So we learned that through trial and error. Like we have to have to be pretty strict with version control. No, 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 no. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, I had my own kind of, what what you call it? Just complete heart attack moment. I was sending um, my story to my editor at the time and I wanted to change something, you know, something just pops into your head. Oh wait, no, I don't like that. And I went back to go and find it in what I'd sent her and it wasn't there. And I was like, right. I was really confused. I was just like, but I wrote this. So I went to go and check another bit and that wasn't there either. Oh, yeah. I I, I'd sent her just something that hadn't had any of my changes. She must have thought I was crazy because I just sent her the exact same thing. I couldn't find it. It was only because of Google Docs just saving all of the different versions that I had to open every single one. I'm like, where is it? Till this day, I can't figure out why it didn't save properly. But I found it in the end. It's fine. But that that mini heart attack was just not even. <laughs> it's the worst feeling in the world. I had I had the same moment. It's probably like two months ago where I thought I had lost like a week's work. Like I, I did exactly the same thing. I was working in the document and I remembered I wanted to change something, went back to look for the change and it wasn't there. And went looking for other changes and realized that I had lost massive chunks of work. What I'd done is just opened up the wrong document and started working in the wrong document. But yeah, that feeling of dread that you just lost 10,000 words. It's horrible. It was just, I was just like, no. And the thing is for people that, don't know like hear me thinking i'm professional um but for someone who for, to say things like oh just do it again i will fucking kill you you like no i can't just no. do it again Let's no you never do it again you never do it well it's not gonna you never, be you never write it as well. oh gosh i was i was in absolute tears i was just like where is it where is it it was just it, okay. it is a horrible feeling it's like it's like the feeling of losing your wallet and your keys yep. times 10 <laughs> <laughs> like you know i left my child on the bus where yeah whoops where do i put the kid <laughs> now on the train no it was it was horrific but no okay so i want to take a step back so obviously you're talking about co-authoring and stuff and you mentioned going the uh, the gender roles you know just kind of i'll do the boys and you know you'll do the girls and stuff so kind of touching on that and this is my this is my favorite bit this is what i want to talk about let's talk smut okay right right let's talk smut right okay I've got I've got a whiskey here, so I'm primed. Let's talk smart. Now, you're you're a man, you know. So they tell me. So they tell me you're a man, and you know I was reading Never Night, and I've got just the three hundred page like sampler of Empire, so I've not got to you know let other stuff yet. Um, but yeah, there's nothing too heavy in those first three hundred. Yeah, not in the first bit. He's just got the you know the weird dreamy blowjob thing. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we haven't got anywhere else yet, but fine, it will come. No. But, you know, there are quite a few male authors that I read and they kind of, you know, shy away from the sexy time, like Hez talking to you, Pierce Brown, anyway. Um, you know, <laughs> like thousands of words and they just like kiss just one time. Like it's really boring. Anyway, um, you don't shy away from- He's like a very attractive man. I imagine he has had quite a lot, I'm presuming. <laughs> He's a very handsome man, so yeah. So hot. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's not, it's not fair. I've met him in real life. He's that good looking in real life. Um, it's just, yeah. you just look at him across the bar, you're like, you motherfucker. But he's so <laughs> nice. You can't be mad at him. No, definitely. <laughs> like, I just, I, re I only discovered Red Rising probably about a couple of months ago. And you right. know, really devoured the first trilogy. I'm on Iron Gold at the moment. And obviously, I was like, you know, everyone's raving about it. It's really good. And I was like, and every girl, woman said to me, but have you seen him? I was like, what do you mean? You know, went on to... <gasps> it's, it's, like... it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> and you're a writer? You're not supposed to... Yeah. What? It was just... No, it was... Oh. But anyway, no, I digress. I digress. But yeah. yeah. Pierce is hot, but he doesn't write hot. Do you like writing hot? Because we like your hot. Because it's good. <laughs> it's good. Do I like... What do you mean, do I like it? Like, what does that mean, like? I don't know. Is it something you like want to put in, or is it more like we asked you to do it? So now you like put it in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's 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 very it's a very strange experience. Um, <laughs> Sorry. For a, for a lot of different reasons. Um, for, firstly, that my mum reads all my books. Really? Um, 
Yeah, so I it. have to warn her about, I'm not sure whether she reads those bits, but when I give her, like, I'll go back to the West Coast where my parents live for Christmas and I bring my books with me, uh, uh -huh. give them to my mum. Uh, but I put post-it notes in the pages where the rude bits are to let her know. Yeah. Um, so she can skip them if she chooses. And I've never actually, I've never delved too deeply into whether she reads them or not, but I think that she does. I know that, I know that mum and dad listened to Dark Dawn on audiobook when they were going on like a driving holiday. And there's some pretty full on scenes in Dark Dawn. I can just imagine my parents sitting, <laughs> sitting in the car, driving down the highways of Western Australia, listening to their son's no. film. Um, I think that's one of my issues with audiobooks generally. Like I've not gone to that that side just yet. I'm, you know, I'm a paperback, hardback girl. Do you know what I mean? But right. but some of the books, you know, I read and if they have those parts, I'm like, you're gonna hear somebody talk back to you? Like my ears feel yeah. dirty. That's weird. I just I don't understand. Oh. That. I don't really get it. It's and just... it, I think it takes a certain kind of reader to as in audiobook narrator to be able to pull that off. <laughs> um, I know there's a guy called Steve West who is quite Famed. He, he reads a lot of romance novels um, and he read for Cal for our Aurora Rising series. Oh. He has like a following all of his own. Yeah. Like people follow him because he has the sexy voice and does the sexy read for the sexy scenes. Um, do I like it? It's strange. I mean, it's, it's fun in its own way. Uh, you're very self, I tend to be very self conscious while I do it. Um, I've gotten braver as a, the more I've done it. I guess it's like anything. The, the, I remember the first time I wrote a sexy scene was in Ebonite. Um, and I, I really wasn't sure how people would take it. It was quite a radical departure from what I'd written before. Um, and I had, like all my, all my crit readers are women yeah. and my primary crit reader is my wife. So if you want a weird experience, give your smut scene to your wife or your significant other to read and critique. Like it's just no. bizarre. You know what's funny? So when I, so I only discovered Never Night last year. So right. I, was, I was late to the party, but I obsessed with everything. So I had to buy them all and blah, 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 blah. Cause that's just me. But- Are oh, you got hardcovers? Wow. That would have cost a lot of money. I know. So the US yeah. ones I found, they're fine. Um, yeah. You know, I got them off um, Amazon, that was fine. But the yeah. Never Night UK cover, that was a pretty penny. It really they was. are hard to find, yeah. yeah. But well, I was adamant. I was determined. Right. To have them all. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I discovered it a, li um, a little late, but obviously I was ranting and raving about it, and I made a review and all these kind of things. And someone popped into my DMs and they said, "Have you read three? And I was just like, "What? What do you mean?" And there's obviously the deleted scene, or you know, between the three people. And yeah. I'm not going to say it because I'm actually doing a read along uh, next month. So someone. Okay. Said, into this so I don't want to say who that is but, sure yeah so they were like um I think you sent it out in a newsletter or something at the time but obviously they saved the email and they forwarded it to me and they were like you have to read this you have to read this smart it's amazing um so I read that I read that and I showed it to my Before boy you read that no 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 I finished the series sorry After. I finished oh, okay. the series yeah so I knew who it was and um yeah so then I read it to my boyfriend I was like you have to read this and he was just like what loved it <laughs> oh really that's good <laughs> he absolutely loved it and it was just it was really funny because one thing about the less smut as we say is yeah we're coming from like you know fantasy romance and sarah j mass and jennifer l armantrout and all these kind of names um and it was so obvious that it was i, like I said to him at the time that it was man sex <laughs> if that makes sense so like there was an emphasis on on <laughs> mechanics mechanics rather than feels right yeah <laughs> sure sure and i was just like this is so obvious that a dude wrote this i was like babes read this <laughs> but is that is that a good thing no 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 it was a good thing but it was just because i think prior to this i'd only been reading kind of mark lawrence and who else just just not as many guys as i'd been reading girls so there was just this type of sex that you were reading in books kind of thing and then sure. to you and it was just so much more real and like raw <laughs> I guess, 
and it was so good and i was like this is oh, awesome. good that, that's that's good to hear this is awesome and i was just like yeah okay it was great <laughs> i mean the, the weird thing was when when i was when i made the decision that i was going to write some smart thing never know i had my wife who she reads she's you know the most voracious reader i know uh she reads a lot of stuff but she does read a lot of romance so i had her pick out some of her favorite scenes in her favorite books which again is a weird thing but she she basically prepared this cornucopia of filth for me to read through um and that was one of the things that struck me yeah. um predominantly i mean it's a predominantly female field romance writing but women tend to focus on the fields and men tend to focus on the biomechanics i guess yeah. um so i i mean i try to do both of those but I wasn't sure how people would take it, but like like you say, even though even though it's kind of a different style, yeah. my readership is ninety five percent female, and I got a, I got a lot of compliments about it. I got a lot of people writing to me about it. Um, it was definitely, and so that that kind of encouraged me to to do it a little bit more. Um, it, it is a it is a weird thing to do to put it out into the world. You know, there are people who are it's not going to be their cup of tea and that's fine um there are going to be people who say you know this is obviously written by a dude i, I, I get that critique a lot it's like you yeah, know shit there's a dude's name on the cover of the book like what were you expecting i get a pinch hitter and interrupt my smart um <laughs> but yeah people seem to really like it uh so for you know for whatever reason uh, maybe because it's different maybe because predominantly that kind of thing does get written by women and so my stuff is a little bit more different in perspective i don't i don't know what the rationale is but no, i'm I glad that people do like it because it, it is a weird thing to write so it is it is and i mean you know without being simply about it again i do um you know the the smart as well as the writing and everything about it because one of the reasons i was so obsessed with the series and just you know the writing later on is because there was just I feel anyway, that you're just able to quote unquote do it all in the sense of if you usually when you've got we use Pierce as a, an example, it's it's sci-fi. So it's all very, you know, the mechanics and the names and the, you know, pew, pew, and the fighting and stuff like that. But there were some points where I wasn't emotionally connected to to Darrow or, you know, there were just certain things where it wasn't necessarily gripping. I love it. It's amazing. But there was just some things that are a bit off me. Whereas with you, it was, I cried with, with Mia. I screamed at this book. I, like my, my boyfriend was looking at me like I was not okay. Absolute buckets of tears were coming down my face. You know, like with, you know, with Maggot and all, like, it was oh, just, maggot. yeah, I know. There was just, you're just able to do all the things, whether it's the comedy, um, the swearing, the smart, the emotion, to get all of that, I'm sorry to say, but from a guy, it was uh, it was great because a lot of the time there is something that's just a bit off when it's a dude and yeah i just i really appreciate appreciated reading that so that's my my simp moment my simp moment no that's cool it's really <laughs> nice to be fair. And, and it is it is quite striking that like for whatever reason i i haven't really tapped into the dude fantasy market yet like if you go to a brandon sanderson signing for example like there are dudes for miles like he he gets lady readers he's he's actually kind of cracked both ends of the equation but for whatever reason i haven't managed to get that dude reader yet um 95 of my readers are ladies uh it's quite striking when you go to one of my signings it's ladies for miles so um yeah and, and i don't even know why that is um I guess Empire is my attempt to try and broaden that market. I, I, I don't know whether it's something as simple as male fantasy readers tend to gravitate towards male characters. I, I don't like oversimplifying that way. I'm sure it's something more complex than that, but for whatever reason, it's mostly ladies who like my stuff. So I, I'm glad that you do. No, 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 it, it was really, really good. As I said, genuine tears. <laughs> Genuine. Oh, that's good. I mean, it's weird to take that as a compliment, but <laughs> I'm glad I made you cry. No, you have this reputation of being completely brutal and just breaking everyone. And we just really, really love it because essentially that's, I would assume that's why you write because I know that's why we read. It's like to be able to be in these pages and just 
be absolutely broken is just the best <laughs> feeling to come away from that and feel like you've gone on an adventure like you've gone on a ride and it's just like wow I closed the last page of Dark Dawn and just felt like <laughs> that was good <laughs> and it was just it was so it was just so so good but um uh, using that as a uh, quick segue, I'm conscious of, of time and stuff. Um, no, it's all good, it's all good. I got my whiskey. Uh, <laughs> so, Gabe, so we, we touched obviously on, on Never That and stuff, and I've only briefly met Gabe. I'm really stressed because I wanted an arc and I didn't get one, and now I'm not your friend. But... <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a random number generator. You can't blame me. You've got to blame probability. I don't mean that. And you know what? I'm really bad because obviously I want to read it, but it's more so the magpie collector in me. I just want it to have it, if you see what I mean. <laughs> like sure. I just need it on my shelf. Um, <laughs> you know, I feel better because the one thing I don't have is just the one thing I can't just buy myself. So that's my excuse. Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, sure. so, anyway, <laughs> so we've met Gabe, um, and you know, you're saying about the uh, male fantasy authors might be more because it's a dude and blah 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 blah. But from what I've met so far, he's just as deep. You know, <laughs> he's just as deep. He's just as emotional. Tell me about Gabe. Where do you come from? Obviously, your head. Mm. Um, but where do you come from? What's his deal? Because he's going through some shit. And I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as, as far as characters that I've written goes, he's probably, he has had the rawest deal. I mean, Mia, Mia got it pretty rough. Um, but Mia was in and out quite briefly. Like, her career kind of spanned two years, and then she was done. Um, whereas I've been torturing Gabe since he was 15 and he's 35 when you meet him at the start of empire yeah. um so for those who don't know empire is kind of it, it's basically three books in one there's a framing device where gabe as a 35 year old guy is in prison he's awaiting his execution and he is being interviewed by a vampire um kind of finding out the the story of his life he's this semi-mythical figure he's a paragon of a religious order who's kind of fallen into disrepute uh, and he is asked to to explain how he got there. So the book is really within that framing device. It's two stories. One when he's a fifteen year old, on the verge of becoming sixteen, and he gets recruited into this religious order. Uh, and the other, sorry, Blade School. <laughs> yeah, Blade School. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the other story is when he's a much older man. He's thirty two, and he's kind of become this paragon and fallen out the other side um and he's kind of bitter and broken and faithless mm -hmm. and he's explaining about this quest that he gets inadvertently dragged into um this quest for the solution to day's death day's death is uh it it's the affliction that that kind of starts the world falling into chaos the sun doesn't shine as brightly in the sky anymore and vampires have discovered that sunlight doesn't burn them anymore they can kind of walk around during the day with impunity so they've risen up around this realm and started slowly taking it over. And Gabe gets dragged almost against his will into this quest to, to solve Day's death. So, I mean, as a character, he's he's kind of, I don't want to sound like a wanker when I say it, he's kind of multifaceted. Like you're looking at two states of him, one when he's young and idealistic and, you know, full of the fire of youth and the, the belief that he can change the world. Yeah. And on the other hand, you meet him when he's realized that no, you can't. There's nothing you do that matters. That yeah. you are a, a animated blob of carbon and water on a moat of dust spinning through a universe that does not care. And nothing that you nothing you do has a legacy and nothing that you do means anything. So it's kind of this contrast between those two sides of him. Um, really underpinned by questions of faith, like if Empire is about anything, if there's any theme that I'm kind of trying to explore. It, it's faith, it, it's belief in the idea of a higher power and belief in yourself. Yeah. You know, Gabe gets indoctrinated into a religious order when he's very young yeah. uh, and he's a believer when he joins, but some terrible things happen to him over the course of his life that makes him lose faith in, not only in the idea of a benevolent creator, but also that there's really kind of meaning to this existence. So those questions are an exploration of the questions that are bugged me my whole life like I got raised religious I went to I went to church every Sunday for 17 years until I until I got a car uh, and then I stopped going yeah but kind of from a young age you know the 
the illogic, I guess, of, I was raised Roman Catholic, uh, the illogic of the Roman Catholic faith kind of struck me, started hitting me about 10 years old, you know, okay. if this, if this immortal sky father loves us so much, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is granddad dead of cancer? That kind of stuff, simple questions. Um, and the answers that you get given traditionally speaking from people within authority within those structures are pretty unsatisfying. You know, they are, God has a plan. You will understand when you die, it'll all be fine once you're dead kind of stuff. Um, so the book is about exploring those questions and coming up with satisfactory answers. Um, that, that's really the underpinning. And, and that was the genesis of him as a character, kind of taking a character who had been through this extraordinary high and kind of fallen out the other side and lost belief and understanding where he was when he started and how he got to where he is when you meet him. Yeah. No, as I said, going through that, I, I can't remember exactly what it is now, but even the first, like the opening page, the opening line was so like hard hitting. He was just like, I don't know. I can't remember what he said. God is something, something. What is it? You know, uh, ask me not if God exists, but why is such a prick? Yeah. And I was just like, this is going to be good. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is that Gabe doesn't have the luxury of being an atheist. Like I'm an atheist. I, I think okay. it's all nonsense, but when you he lives in a world where God is made manifest, like you can hold up yeah. a religious simple and, and, you know, a vampire will repel you throw holy water in their face and they get burned. So there's physical proof that there is a deity. He doesn't have the luxury of believing that there is nothing to believe in. Yeah. He is confronted with the idea that, yeah, there is this, thing up there and it, he just doesn't care yeah. which is a which is a terrible kind of it's a terrible resolution to reach um so yeah the book is really a study of of coming to grips with that resolution and, and finding something to believe in even in the in the in the face of a world that probably encourages you not to yeah no 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 i'm i'm really as i said i haven't been able to um, get the full book yet but I'm really invested in his his mind his way of thinking because there is so much uh, pain for lack of a better word there's so much pain there that I don't necessarily know why yet I mean I have my my suspicions um but yeah I don't, I don't um, generally know why yet but you can see you know from the the opposite seeing him younger and you know oh my gosh we can't do this we have to follow the rules and we have to do that and blah 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 and then later to be this dude that's just like fuck this fuck that you're all stupid this is dead like <laughs> it's just like yeah. what happened to you dude I mean I think I know what happened it hurt you <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah it's it's I love how it's been written in the sense of having that juxtaposition if you see what I mean so it's not just the first half of the book is him young and then the second half of the book is him old. The mix and coming out and speaking to the chronicler and realizing, oh yes, we're telling a story. And, you know, I find that so interesting. I just love different ways of writing. Style is fine and, you know, all of those things, but, you know, having it like an interview or, you know, before he's dying, that was amazing. Um, going back to Devonite quickly, like the opening pages having the dual events, but they sure. were talking about two different things like it was just how do you come up with this <laughs> it's like because you know I just start once upon a time <laughs> but you know there's just different ways like obviously the infamous footnotes it's just where do you come up with just making it different that's such a broad question but how do you come up with just making it just you know you <laughs> it's just, just different I guess it's a hard question to answer. It's almost the, you know, the, the where do your ideas come from question. Um, I mean, as far as the footnotes idea came from, I mean, in a sense, I realized very quickly that Nevernight was going to be a very dark book um, and go to very dark places. So the footnotes were doing a couple of things. One, you know, there are, there are a way to compartmentalize info dumping for want of a better word. And I hate that fucking term because people use it to dismiss. I think people use it to dismiss epic fantasy in general. Like if you're writing an entirely new world, I have to fucking explain it to you kids. So if you don't have the patience to sit through half a page of me explaining how this works, then, you know, read contemporary. But yeah. um, so my, one of the rationales with the footnotes was, 
if you don't like huge chunks of exposition, if you don't care where the coinage came from or how this particular mode of sword fighting got its name, then if I compartmentalize that information and you don't care, you can just skip it. Like the good one of the things about Nemonites, you can skip the footnotes. You don't really miss out on much of Mia's story. Yeah. You might miss out on a sense of the world, but her story is still whole in the pages. But one of the other jobs that I was trying to do with those footnotes is make you laugh. Um, because the story was quite dark, yeah. having a segue, having a having a cheekier side to the reader um, that was kind of self-aware and breaking the fourth wall was an opportunity to just lighten the tone, um, to bring a bit of levity into what could have otherwise been a very grim book. Yeah. Um, I love the film. I thought they were awesome. Oh, thanks, thanks. They're, they're, they're quite divisive. <laughs> um, no, in I terms of the that opening that opening chapter that kind of juxtaposition between the first kill and the first time Mia sleeps with someone. Yeah. I couldn't even tell you where that idea came from. Um, I, I guess it, it comes from not being afraid to do bad, not, not being afraid to fail, like trying ideas without any expectation on them, without prejudging before you start writing. Just if you have a weird thought, then put it down on the page. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, it might be the best thing you've ever written. It might be absolutely garbage, but the, there is, I think for all of us, there is an editor in our head. There's a filter that sometimes for fear of failure or critique or just you know the idea that it might be stupid stops us even trying, um, stops us even putting those words down on the page. And when it's just you in front of your laptop, no one's looking, no one's gonna judge you, no one cares. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is sometimes simply a question of trying something that you think is stupid because it could be the coolest thing that you ever wrote. Um, so so being, being fearless and not listening to that internal editor, at least on the first pass, I mean, that internal editor definitely has a role to play and you need to be able to judge your work critically and analytically. But when you're in those early formative stages, when, you know, the steel is just being poured into the mold. Like, don't don't be afraid to make mistakes because if you make a mistake, big deal. You just delete it. It's not it's not a drama. Um, so yeah, be unafraid and try weird stuff. I guess is the best advice I can give. I'm not sure if that's a adequate answer, but that that's kind of what I try to do. No, that's awesome because it's just like you. I think as writers, as readers, we want to be um, shocked by by new things, but we all want to be. The person that creates these new things do you know what I mean as much as you can love the art of writing and you know I do it for the you know do it for the love of the written word it's like no we all want to be famous like let's admit this I mean, <laughs> you, want, you, want, like, <laughs> you, you want people you want to find an audience yes. I guess it's not necessarily about fame but yeah, yeah it, it is I mean yeah if you were being honest and you didn't want some level of affirmation from other people then you would never publish your work you know and that goes for anything whether you're a musician or a writer or a director or whatever you would film your short film and you'd save it on your hard drive and never show it to anybody um so yeah there, there is a great deal of gratification that can come from affirmation from other people so yeah i, I guess we all want an audience um not not necessarily fame but yeah that that's that's definitely true I yeah i mean yeah, sure <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that either but no, 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 I definitely get that. Um, what was I going to say? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, research was what I was going to say. So, find your audience. You've got your idea. You've got your book. Well, you don't have your book. Nevernight was ancient Rome. Inspired. And Merchant of Prince of Venice, yeah. Merchant of Venice. Awesome stuff. Loved it with the whole, you know, Caesar vibe. It was, it was, it was lit. Empire is... France. What kind of century France? I'm never good at this. I mean, it's it's late Middle Ages. They have they have the equivalent of gunpowder. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it, it's it's not so much France. It's it's Western European inspired. Um, the the colonial power of the setting is inspired by the French. Um, certainly, the the roots of the language and the naming conventions are French. Yeah. Uh, and that that was an interesting problem to solve because that the, they're called the Eladani. Um, they are the easternmost country on the continent. They have been successfully controlling the continent for 600 years. Um, so obviously their culture has kind of bled out 
into the surrounding areas. And I, I again, I use ancient Rome. Ancient Rome is one of my hobbies. I, I, I can speak on about three topics in the world with any degree of authority. It's like Marvel Comics, board games, and ancient Rome. That's kind of it. Okay. Um, but like ancient Rome had a particular method of colonization yeah. where they would, you know, they would walk into a country, they would kill the army, they would take the sons back to Rome to be educated as Romans, and they would pay Roman men to move to the new country and marry local daughters. Mm-hmm. And so within the space of like two or three generations, the country is Romanized. Um, you know, invaded is another way to put it. But so the Eladani basically used that technique as well. So their culture has been bleeding westward for like 600 years. So in in the Nordland, for example, which is the country that's adjacent to Eladane, the etymology of that language and those naming conventions are Spanish, yes. but the French etymology has kind of been bleeding westward. So that was a that was an interesting puzzle to solve, like how much local culture would be preserved in the face of this overwhelming colonial power. So, yeah, um, that that's the kind of thing I kind of spitball and think about it. And, and the weird thing is, ninety percent of that research and thought doesn't actually make it to the page. Okay. But you, as the creator of the world, it's a good idea if you actually understand the way those mechanics work. Um, because it will inform the few parts of it that do make it to the page and make the world feel more authentic. So, for example, the Nordland, which is the country that's adjacent to Eladane, that has the most Eladane influence in terms of its aristocracy, in terms of its naming conventions, in terms of its political structures. And the further east and south you get, the, the more the, those local cultures have kind of retained their identity just because of the tyranny of proximity, you know the closer you are to the colonial power, the more in the grip of that colonial power you're going to be. Right. No. no, no, that makes sense. I mean, how do you start with that level of research? Because I'll tell you for free, I'm sure that like, it's just like, it's fancy. I made it up, it's fun. But like, <laughs> how do you go, like, where do you start? Is it library? Is it Google search? I don't know. Like, I'm, I need to get my head around research. It's just so boring. <laughs> I mean, I, I find history really interesting and I always have. Um, history was one of the few topics at school that I actually enjoyed. Uh, I, so I don't have a better answer for you than that. Like history is something that I've always been interested in, like um, n- not even necessarily military history, but just the rise and fall of empires. Um, the, way, the way the world shifts and moves in familiar patterns, yet is always kind of evolving into something new. Like the, the rise and fall of empires typically follows the same broad pattern. Um, you know, you can look at the fall of the British Empire or the decline of the British Empire, I guess, and not to offend your British readers. Um, you know, that, that, that follows very similar patterns to, say, the, the f- decline of the Greek Empire or the decline of the Roman Empire. So understanding in a broader sense how those patterns evolve um, will, will give you a grounding, I guess. I mean, the... I think, honestly, one of the best things a fantasy author can arm themselves with is a knowledge of history, because not only is it an incredibly rich ground in which to glean ideas, the weirdest shit, weirdest shit than you could possibly imagine have, has already happened over the course of human history. Like battles have been fought and lost on the flip of a coin, the most, the most random events coalesce into world shaking events like you know the 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 spread of the black plague for example it it depends on who you read but there are some there's some historical theory that links the spread of the the bubonic plague back to i think it was one of the pope gregory's i can't remember which i can't remember the name of this pope now but one of the popes got it into his head that cats were the agent of of satan they were minions of the devil and they were on this earth to to relay information back to the Lord of the pit. Mm -hmm. And so there was a pogrom on cats in medieval Europe. Like they were minions of the devil. You saw a cat, you killed it. Cats eat rats, cats keep vermin under control. And so with this massive die off of cats that led to an explosion in rat and mice population, which in turn led to the spread of fleas, which carried the bubonic plague. Like if you were sitting uh, trying to imagine those confluence of events as an author and just pluck them out of your head, you have to be a kind of genius, but the, the world has already solved that problem for you. And history is replete with incidents like that. So I, I think 
yeah, having a, having a broad understanding of history is a really useful tool for a fantasy author to have. No, no, that definitely makes sense. I mean, even with, um, what's his face? George Martin. Game of Thrones, yeah. I mean, it's War of the Roses with dragons. Exactly, with dragons. <laughs> yeah, that's a bad, bad, bad. And like you could you could walk into your agent's yeah. office tomorrow and say, hey, if it hadn't already been done, I mean, if you if you walked into your agent's office tomorrow and said, hey, I got this idea, yeah. it's the War of the Roses, but with fucking dragons. <laughs> like that's all you'd need to say. <laughs> like your agent would just be, yes, bring me this thing immediately. Like it's, it's just a cool idea. So yeah, having an understanding of history and any like obviously history is vast um, and nobody's going to be able to hold all that in their heads. But, you know, there are amazing, interesting periods of history all over the globe. So, you know, I'm not a historian. I'm a historian of certain periods, ancient Rome being one of them. So I drew quite heavily on that to write Nevernight. You know, Mia's father, Darius, is basically a thought experiment. What would happen if Julius Caesar failed? You know, Julius Caesar was very famous Roman general he got told by the Roman Senate that he was becoming too powerful and he had to disband his armies and come back to Rome yeah and Caesar made the decision no fuck you I'm not I'm, I'm bringing my army back to Rome and I'm gonna tell you motherfuckers what, what's what <laughs> um if if that throw of the dice had failed yeah. what would have happened to Caesar's family that's the question that was at the heart of Nemanai you know Caesar had a daughter her name was Julia Darius has a daughter, her name is Mia. What are the consequences for the people that he loves if that throw of the dice fails? Yeah. So yeah, history is your friend. It really is. And sorry, I'm definitely gonna cut this bit out because it's hundred percent a spoiler. Um, but finally, I need to cut that bit out. So I'm almost done, I'm almost done. So two things. So the first one, Dior is, oh no, can I say this bit? It's a bit spoilery. Dior is who he is or he yep. is is yeah sure that's very dan brownie <laughs> sure it's, you know, yeah. is that well, like it's holy, huh? it's holy blood holy grail which is where dan brown told you. i was reading that but i was like we've done this dude what are you doing <laughs> it's just like you stole this that's the same <laughs> yeah for sure yeah it's like is that normal like why are we stealing stuff <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, again, it kind of, it's going back to drawing on historical context, I guess. Um, that's a, that's a historical theory. And it's not like, it's, it's a weird, the sampler is quite odd in that it ends at that point And it feels like a big twist where actually that's kind of the start of the story. Yes, exactly. But that, that, you know, in, in something like the Da Vinci Code, that's the point of the story. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Empire, that is the beginning of the actual tale. And, you know, there's still you know, 500 pages of the book after that. Oh, but yeah, it, it comes back to kind of yeah, yeah, drawing on those historical contexts again. Like Dan Brown took that idea from a book called Holy Blood. Yeah. Holy Blood and Holy Grail, I think it was called. Yeah. And it came out in like the, the early 90s. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, being raised Roman Catholic um, and kind of being confronted with that theory I, I still remember that in the 90s when that the controversy around that book first rose um and i remember reading that that uh, dude that i used to work with at an advertising agency gave me that book to read because he knew i was raised that way mm -hmm. um so i guess it, it kind of stuck with me as a concept but yeah the, the sampler is quite weird in that it ends at that point and it feels like that's a big twist whereas if you were to just turn the page it's it's just another chapter that follows right after that um so i kind of view that as the first stepping stone of the actual journey and the beginning of the transformation of the relationship between Gabe and Dior. Yeah. Um, so yeah, don't, don't, um, don't stress too much on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the important thing. Like my boyfriend, no, it's really not. No. No, my boyfriend taught me a new word. Um, MacGuffin. Is that it? So MacGuffin. Like, yeah. So it's like, even though the Holy Grail is like the ultimate, MacGuffin there is in the sense of everybody wants it or calls it a thing but it's sure. really important like even with like Indiana Jones and stuff it's just like okay you went through all of these things to get it but what is it like it's just kind of sure. this thing that sets other things in motion it's not actually the point kind of thing Correct. yeah, yeah. That, that I mean the, the the acquisition and control of Dior is definitely uh, a driving force in the narrative. So there, there is more and more people 
some of them not people um, who want control of the aura. And that definitely propels the narrative in that second stage of the book, the 32 year old Gabe storyline. Um, yeah, it, it's not so much, yeah, the revelation of what Dior is, is, yeah, it's it's the fuel that drives the rest of the plot forward, I guess. It's not it's not the point of the book, it's the fuel of the book, I guess, is a good way to look at it. No worries, no worries. Um, Astrid, we love Astrid. Yeah, we're oh loving, good. Yeah, we're loving her straight away, giving me real Mia vibes, but we're loving her. <laughs> I, yeah, I think her her opening line to Gabe yeah. uh, is one of my favourite <laughs> opening lines of any character that I've ever written. When they meet, when they meet in the library, I won't tell people what it is, but yes, yes, yes. what she says to him, yeah. In the library, no, no, no. I'm really loving Astrid. You know, even just the whole, you know, I'm a fucking queen. All of this stuff, like she's she's just already got bad bitch vibes, and I'm just I'm absolutely loving her. I will, but uh, I'm so excited for it. And you know, as I said, we've got a month and a bit to go. Um, yeah, it's pretty close now. It's, uh, it's getting close considering i've had these pre-ordered what late last year like we've oh wow that's awesome thank you yeah yeah no seriously the first one because as i said i discovered nevernight late so i didn't like i was like i will not be late again i was like yes i'm gonna be <laughs> you know of the first ones to read it and stuff so just my pre i've had to make like a little folder in my emails to be like pre-orders because i'll forget like i don't know what's coming or what <laughs> stuff coming from australia from us it's just it's too much it's just too much amazing i mean but like i've said this before but the the reason why empire got all those special editions and fancy covers and whatever is because of the initial reaction to that first waterstones special edition that we put out like weirdly enough when it went up on the website i wasn't even supposed to know it was just their web guy who had been a busy little beaver and pushed it live before he was supposed to ah. so i found out that it, oh it's live on the tuesday it was supposed to go up on the thursday i let readers know mm -hmm. and within like uh, i can't remember what the period of time it was in a matter of hours we sold like six thousand copies like they were totally sold out before it was even supposed to go on sale okay. and as a result of that waterstones wrote back to voyager and we're like uh can we have some more we went out with a second sale on the Thursday and they sold out like instantly. And it was all because of that, that all these other retailers kind of jumped in on the back of it and said, can we have one as well? So oh, that's how it, 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 sound, it sounds cheesy, but I have always been an author who was propelled forward by his readership. You know, Nebonite was not a book that got a lot of attention when it came out. It didn't get any kind of advertising or marketing budget. It got zero dollars. Like no one gave a fuck about that book. Mm -hmm. um, but on the back of a handful of book bloggers and Instagrammers who went out and pushed that book and became like evangelists for it, the readership built up over the course of a couple of years. And so by the time Dark Dawn came out, it was an international bestseller. It sold like half a million copies around the world. That's all because of you guys. So Absolutely. I know I sound like a broken record when I say it, but like, thank you for the pre-orders. Thank you for everyone out there who's spreading hype about it. Yeah. and is you know talking to their friends about it pre-ordering the books memeing about it whatever whatever you're doing to spread the word like it's because of you that i get to do what i do for a living so i am so incredibly grateful to all of you um you included like, it, it means the world you let me do what i do and what i do is the best job that i've ever had so thank you it means I a lot yeah and i mean it's good to obviously as you've touched on it's just like because we pre-order um, that's why other things pop up and I feel like sure. you know, without being too negative we won't go there um, but people are like you know you've got loads of arcs or you've got loads of this because you're a man or because you're you know because you're oh, yeah. because you're this there was all of that you know noise going on um, so yep. it's good to know that it is for you know it is from readership it is from you know if you it's switch all readers it's, it's all readers like the we'll like as, as far as the US goes, like I, I love my US publisher, um, but they're quite risk averse oh. and they don't traditionally invest in, in much. Um, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't until that Waterstones sale out, until we sold, I think it was like 8,000 copies in 24 hours or something. I wrote to my US editor and said, hey man, this just happened. Mm. What are we doing in America? Yeah. And he's like, uh, nothing. <laughs> but, may, but maybe I'll have a conversation with the sales department yeah. and a week later 
the head of sales at St. Martin's Press was emailing me and saying, hi, you've never met me before. Maybe we should have a Skype chat. Okay. Um, and on the back of that, everything kind of fell into place. So yeah, it, 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 it's always been about readers for me um, with my adult stuff. Like you guys were the ones that made Never Night an international bestseller. You guys were the ones that destroyed the Waterstones website two, two days in a row. Um, and, and got all these incredible things happening. So I, I do sound like a broken record when I say it, but thank you to everyone who, who did that for me because we without you, I, I wouldn't get to do this thing. No, we love to hear it. And I think, like we said at the top of the conversation, you know, because you do have a you know connection and kind of relationship with, with us and stuff, it's, it feels more genuine and it feels more like, you know, it's like, oh, I bought my friend's book. <laughs> <laughs> It has like a you know a connection so that's really good and you know we we love that um it's good to um as i said it's good for people to to understand the process because you know coming from indie writers and stuff we don't we think we know but we don't know you know our idea i, mean, I, don't, I don't even know half the time um <laughs> I mean, like the, the, the video that i posted um the other day of the harper production team kind of showing the way the book was built i've written fucking 16 books and that's the first time i've seen that so I'm, I'm still constantly learning. I know. I was a bit upset though. You remember you put on, you were saying, should the title go down or should it go across? Because what was it? Should I flex and put it across? I should I flex, yeah. <laughs> no, that was the US cover. That's oh, the US one. I was just like, I wanted yep. to see the flex. Like, it should go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we, we flexed on the US cover. Yeah, oh, for sure. It, it runs, it runs horizontal. It's horizontal. Got you. Yeah. I was excited for that. Um, Why? <laughs> Just, just my own question again. Why do US have different covers? Or why are there different covers anyway? What is that for? Um, it's a very interesting question. For my money? I don't know. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's the perception that the UK and US markets are different. Um, I don't know whether there's any truth to that yeah. way of thinking. I mean, they have entire marketing departments who are kind of studying the problem. So I presume there's some... Reason. kernel of truth to it but i mean they, they have sales data to back up you know they they can look at what covers work and what covers don't so you know in america covers with figures on them tend to sell well and in the uk covers with figures on them tend not to no one really knows why that is or even if that's you know the, the one theory could be, you know, the perception is that covers with figures on them don't sell in the UK. So publishers in the UK don't make covers with figures on them. So covers with figures on them don't sell in the UK. You know what I mean? It can become this self-perpetuating cycle. Yeah. Um, but it could be, you know, someone obviously reached that resolution for a reason back in the day. Um, and, you know, that perception persists. Um, I think part of it is ego as well. Like, the publishers kind of want to outdo each other and come up with a cooler cover. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm sure everyone is. Yeah. No, Sorry. hey, like it might, it might obviously just be because I'm British and I might just be proving, you know, this whole thing right. But the British cover for me feels like the book, for lack of better words. You know, it's got the intricate design by what's his name? Kirby something. Kirby. Yeah, he's incredible. You know what I mean? It feels old world. It feels ancient. It like, it just you know with the shield and the the wolves and the you know it's there's something about that whereas the u.s cover looks like tekken <laughs> it's just like <laughs> this is like picture fighter like <laughs> i mean like it looks awesome gabe looks hot as shit but it's just like why it looks more video gamey whereas the book itself feels like yeah i i guess it comes down to perception of what readers gravitate towards like the, there's a really famous story about uh twilight mm. strangely enough um I don't know whether you've ever seen it, but the original UK cover of Twilight was radically different. Okay. It's like this weird illustrated figure. Um, and the books launched simultaneously in the UK and the US and it exploded in the US and wasn't doing anything really to note in the UK. They changed the cover to the US cover, which is probably in my opinion, one of the best covers ever. Like the, the Twilight cover from a graphic design perspective is just incredible. Oh, they changed the UK cover to the US cover in Britain and sales fucking exploded. So it's not it's not that they always get it right, but they're operating from yeah, perceptions that markets behave in different ways. 
no worries no worries i mean as i said it just keeps stealing my money but <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah that's not the intention weirdly enough i mean the sometimes if, if the cover is clearly better than the the various countries will adopt them you know the the original cover for aurora rising that america had planned was very different but they saw strangely enough the australian cover mm -hmm. for aurora rising and liked it better and so that then they adopted it so they're, they're not above changing their mind if something is demonstrably better but yeah they, they have their own beliefs and understandings about the markets that they're creating for and yeah. that's the data they operate on when they're creating the covers okay all right okie dokie so last question and then i'm going to love you and leave you all right you know the book's not even out yet <laughs> But how long do we have to wait for the next one? <laughs> Are you writing? Are you not writing? I am. Are you taking a break? What's happening? No, no, I'm working on book two right now. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got about 100,000 words down. Uh, I'm not sure how many of those will actually make it to the book. Uh, I'm guessing lengthwise it will probably be longer than book one because book twos tend to be that way. And book one was shelf. 240. I don't have shelf Sorry, space. Sorry. I don't have shelf space. I know they're going to be fat books. I'm, I'm, I apologize in advance. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm working on book two at the moment. Um, and unlike previous years, I don't have any other projects on the boil at the moment. So book two is kind of getting my sole attention. Obviously, I'm yeah. devoting more and more time to promotion of book one, yeah. and that will get more and more intense leading up to September. And then after that, hopefully things will die down a little bit. Um, so long answer short i don't know it will depend how i go for the rest of the year how much how many words i get down by kind of december this year will dictate what the actual release date is obviously empire is a little bit more complicated in terms of production because we get bonnie to do the illustrations and that takes a little bit more time um so yeah all, all i can say is that i i don't know hopefully soon i i won't do it with george i won't i won't pull a george on you love to george um but you won't have to wait years for the next one okay good stuff good stuff <laughs> and it's a trilogy right. it is yes it's a trilogy nice one well as i said i'm gonna love you and leave you thank you so 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 much for the talk today i've had so you are more than welcome <laughs> i've had so much fun um you know guys as we discussed never night series aurora rising empire of the vampire um even like the lotus ward trilogy we didn't even touch on that like that was down here there is just so much work to be had from Mr. Christoph. So I implore you to check it all out um, before the release of Empire uh, September 7th. Is that? I think it's, uh, it's the 7th. Yeah. Yeah. I keep seeing some people say 14th, but I think that might be. That's America. That's America. That's the <laughs> we yeah. get it first. Yo. Um, <laughs> so thank you for tuning in to Books and Shit. Obviously, with me, your girl, Charlie Author. Uh, make sure you share and follow and all that good stuff um, and let everybody you know listen to this wonderful conversation and i'll speak to you all again in two weeks bye